there is an ownership we are to be taking in this world. Not one that's dominating, but one that takes ownership in a sense where whatever it is that God gives to us to be able to do and to affect will be productive. Right? Will be what it is and get better. And that's God's idea. God's idea is not just getting by. And when we're in situations when we're, where we're forced to just kind of have to get by, uh, it's a good thing and a godly thing to seek better and to pray that specifically, God, what do you have me here to do to be productive and to be resourceful? And then we looked at the fall and how uh, disobedience to God sort of broke God's idea and damaged these kinds of things about life and kind of ended there, right? Now we're going to go... We're going to start at Noah and basically go through the rest of the Old Testament. Um, find my tool here. So I'm not as manly these days because this is my tool for work. Okay. Um, now, of course, we're going to focus on specific things that will get us through the idea, the basic idea of the rest of the Old Testament. Okay. And uh, that should leave us anticipating tomorrow night and what occurs in Christ and how it all fits together. But we'll still see in stronger ways how God wants to do and, 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 and um, uh, was doing what he set out to do from the beginning. Okay, Just as a reminder, uh, people that I have to thank for the stuff I've learned largely uh, is primarily Dr. N.T. Wright, also Richard Hayes. A couple of scholars who have excellent material and who are like leading scholars on this kind of stuff. Okay. Whoa, hey, how'd that get there? That wasn't supposed to. That was, I was supposed to have a picture of Pastor Tommy. That uh, somehow I made that mistake. Sorry about that. Okay, so on our road to the biblical story, we dealt with the creation, human vocation. I don't, you probably can't even see, right? Okay, not unless I put it in the black. If you're from a certain kind of background and this winds up hitting your chest, don't go crazy on me, right? It's just me. Uh, creation and fall. Tonight, we're going to start with the story of Noah, which I think tends to really not get as much play, not as much exposure uh, when we deal with the Bible. But there are some specific key things that come out in what God says in the story of Noah that's so important for the story, for the biblical story. I'm not going to cover the details of the flood and the ark, okay, which is the part that we're all used to. And I don't want to take for granted that somebody may not know this story, okay. But for those who may not, it's the story of when God floods the earth in a form of judgment but saves Noah and his family because it says God found him to be righteous, pleasing to God, so God saved him in order to preserve humanity in the world and the rest of the creatures while everything else and everybody else was wiped out, okay? So let's begin looking at the story of Noah. This is the written account of Adam's family line. Do we have a mic too for other people to read? When God created mankind or humankind, he made them how? In the likeness, the image of God. He created them, male and female, both made in the image of God, and blessed them. And he named them mankind or humanity when they were created. Okay, so this is a recalling of the creation account. After the fall, beginning the story of Noah, some of this language begins to get used again. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's from Genesis 1. Okay? The reminder of God's intention for humanity. Do we have a reader? You want to read for us, brother? Didn't know what you were walking into, did you? Or sister? Reading. Genesis okay. 6. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy, to destroy both of them and the earth. 
So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Okay. Quite a bit of stuff here, right? This is where God lets Noah know what's going to happen and how Noah is to be used for preservation. But who's heard the word covenant before? Okay. Anybody have a, an idea of what it means? What was that? Union? Yeah, so a union is involved. Yeah, good. Any, anybody else? Same contract, right? Yeah, sort of like a contract, but stronger than a contract, at least as we know it, right? Two companies may contract on a particular project. One wants to make sure that the other side is offering something that this side gets a good deal on, right? And there are ways you can break that contract and try to set up some legal parameters and stuff like that. But in a covenant, you're more emphasizing what you yourself are going to do for the other side. And the other side does the same thing. And the idea is a union that is supposed to be unbreakable. And of course, what's a modern day version of a covenant? Marriage, right? Okay. This is the first time the word covenant is used in the Bible. When God speaks to Noah, that term is now introduced here. I mean, a term familiar to the, to the original readers and writers of this. But for our purposes, who don't tend to use this word, this is the first time it's used in the story. And it is to Noah, with the result being, it will protect you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives, all who are connected to Noah in some way, so that, oh, okay, I don't have that. I didn't have that come out yet. I thought I did. Um, so he tells him to bring all living creatures with him, male and female, right, in order to preserve all the other animals and everything that's living and breathing in creation. Now, covenant I have is an alliance pledge or agreement between two parties established by a taken life, usually an animal. We do it with the signing of a pen. They did it by the killing of an animal. That was sort of the signature, as if to say our lives are on the line for this covenant. Both parties become identified by that covenant. Now, it's the first use of the word in the Bible, as I said, and one of the most important terms in the whole story of God's plan. Okay. Uh, we have another reader. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both of them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. You know what? You could stop there. I'm sorry. I just realized that's a duplicate slide. I forgot to delete that one. Lucy just read that. So the point is all who are in Noah, all who are in Noah, this whole you, your sons, and your wives, and and all that stuff, uh, all who are genetically connected are spared from the judgment. But keep in mind that phrasing, that type of wording, all who are in Noah. That's going to be important for the story, for the gospel. Okay? Now, we're not going to read all this, but I just want to show you once this is said to Noah, what we just read, the word covenant is basically pounded in this little section of Genesis 9. And repetition, which I mentioned last night, but see who was paying attention, repetition lets you know what? Important emphasis is being made here, okay? Okay, why don't you read that for us? Although the story describes God regretting that he made humanity because of their level of evil, God's plan is not to eliminate creation, but rather to implement a plan of recreation. Right, so this becomes incredibly important for the gospel in the New Testament. And I'll say this much about it, trying not to give it away. 
But this is one of the things that has so done a number on me in my view of the gospel and understanding of the biblical story when we think about eternity. And it will come back up in the New Testament. Okay, but God wants to implement a plan of recreation. Right? So from Noah, we go now to this covenant being established with Abraham and the people of Israel. You remember what I called the Old Testament? The story of story of Israel, right, story of Israel. So here we go with the beginnings of the people of Israel. Do we have a reader? Awesome. He didn't know. Yes. <laughs> yes. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Okay, thank you. Wow, that was powerful. I'm going to have her read again. Very dramatic. Now, here comes back. This, I, this is meant to draw the reader back to God's idea of fruitfulness and multiplication for humanity. Except now, instead of humanity being this special representation within the creation, now it's sort of a, a, a portion of humanity within humanity. That's going to be that special representation. And that is the descendants, the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and, and, and the heritage of Noah will be this nation of people that will be God's special representation within humanity. So if you could trace your heritage back to the first Puerto Rican couple, right, that's what Abraham and Sarah are for the Jews. Okay, before Abraham, there was no such thing as a Jew. But God calls him out and says, I'm going to make you a nation to become this. And so, the idea is now, all who are in Abraham will be beneficiaries of this covenant from God that God establishes. Reader? Yeah, you might as well finish the... And I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless this. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, so this is pretty packed with stuff that's important for the whole story, uh, and 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 that's including. This part here that I have underlined that all people on earth will be blessed through you. So the idea was not just that I'll isolate this group of people, they'll be blessed, everybody else won't. But this special representation will be the tool through which God will bless the rest of the world, the rest of the people in the world, and the rest of the creation. And this people will be the people who are the light God's light that shines his idea for life into the rest of the world. So through Abraham and his nation, God would bring blessing to the entire world. Very important for the biblical story. Why don't we have somebody up front, because this font is a little bit uh, smaller, and I have sympathy because I have bad eyes too. So is there a mic up here? No. no. We're on it. We're on it. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Okay, so uh, the idea is you can't count. It's not like the kind of sky that we see. Star here, star there. Oh, look at that little constellation, right? Isn't that pretty? No, when they were looking up at the sky at night, they were looking at this. Okay, you couldn't count the stars. Just as you can't count the stars in the sky, just as you can't count... The sands on the shore, uh, which was another, another way that God communicates to him later. So you won't be able to count the number of people that's going to come out of you to be this fruitful, productive nation. And for those of you who don't know the story, Abraham was 
70, 75, when God called him to do this, he had no children. He was wealthy. He had servants. And in that situation, usually it would get passed down to the most important servant, you know, all his stuff and, and his, his inheritance. Uh, but God is telling him he's going to have a son. His wife is 10 years younger than him. They don't, I don't, I don't have all that up here because um, I'm sticking to stuff that, that, that's going to make major points for the story. But just sort of for fun, if you don't know, Abra, uh, his wife is 10 years younger than him, so she's around 60, 65. And it doesn't actually happen until 25 years later. So he's about 100. She's 90. I hate to picture what it looked like as she's given birth, so I try not to. But the point is, God is doing this. It is God who's setting it up, establishing it, making it happen. Okay? Okay. Do we have a reader? Probably somebody up front. Genesis 15, 5. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven. And number the stars, if you are able to number them, th if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in two, laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and, to, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land. Now, when he says, bring me a heifer, it doesn't mean like, you know, a heifer. Right? Heifer is a young cow, just for clarity. I heard the word and I said, I better clear that up. Um, so uh, now this life of an animal is about to be the signature of the covenant. God tells Abraham what he's going to do down in here where I have it says description of Israel's future. God um, lets Abraham know there's going to be a time in which your people will be enslaved in Egypt. And we'll look at that a little bit later. <clears throat> but I just skipped through that for now. And so here's how the sacrifice goes. When the sun goes down, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. The pieces of the animals were cut in half, set apart from each other, parallel, with the blood running between them, and a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the pieces. Who's passing between the pieces? God. It's God passing between the pieces. What happens in a covenant, generally, all the time, is both parties walk between the pieces to symbolize this whole thing of our lives are, um, are on the line. For this covenant. And we come into it together. Here God is the only one. Who walks through the covenant. Who, or who walks through the pieces. In order to communicate. I, I'm on the line. Me alone. And I alone will make this happen. What I'm saying I'm going to do with you and through you. Okay. Abraham and his wife. Naturally speaking. Can't even produce. At this point in their lives. Okay. Um. And just one more thing here, a little bit up a little earlier, this comes up in the New Testament, that Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him, or, or it was recognized by God as righteousness. So righteousness, being right with God, was identified because of belief. And, there, and, and there's a connection between the two. And here again... This little section in Genesis 17 is just slammed with the word covenant, plastered all over for emphasis as God continues to, to, to just press this and press it in the calling of Abraham. Okay, 
So we go from Ab- now, and there's a whole lot I'm cutting out here, okay? And for some of you who know the story, maybe are wondering, why am I not covering this? Why am I not covering that? Which would make for good sermon material, right? But this isn't necessarily a sermon. We got to do what we can to stick with certain points that will keep coming up and show how the, it's fulfilled in the gospel in order to communicate how God will accomplish what he set out to accomplish so that you can see the whole story. So that's as much as we'll cover about Abraham. There's a lot of mess. There's ways that he um, tries to go another way because he lacks belief at a certain point and tries to have a kid by another woman. And, um, but God keeps coming back to what he promised them. Okay? And eventually they do have their child, and on the story goes. So from Abraham and the covenant established with him to have a people that will be the people of Israel, we go real quickly just to Joseph, the settlement in Egypt, and the slavery of the people. Isaac is the son of Abraham that's born. There's another son, Ishmael, older brother from another woman, who God actually says, he reminds them that's not the child that my covenant is going to be with, but I will bless him. I will bless him. And he winds up becoming a fruitful person. Um, But Isaac is the son through whom the covenant is kind of executed. And then Jacob is Abraham's grandson, and his name is changed to Israel. Real interesting story that happens there. He's sort of a deceiver. I don't know if you got somebody like that in your family, right? Always asking for $20 for gas. <laughs> but you don't know what they're really using it for, okay? Um, able to sweet talk mom, and mom would always fall for it. Okay, he was that child. Uh, and, and he deceived a lot. He gets to a point where he gets confronted by stuff that's now coming back to him in a bad way, wrestles with God. Gets injured, hip actually gets out of joint, and God renames him from Jacob to Israel. And even that's sort of supposed to symbolize the suffering that the nation of Israel would go through and how that would kind of mark them in a way as God's people on some level. Um, But anyway, so you got Isaac, Jacob, out of Jacob, whose name changes to Israel, you have the 12 tribes of Israel. He has 12 sons. Each of those sons represent the head of a tribe of Israel. Make sense? And then from Jacob, you have the great-grandson of Joseph. Now, a lot of you may know Joseph's story. He does provide a lot of great sermon material and stuff for us to apply into our lives and things like that. But as far as the big story goes, uh, so he was sold by his brothers as a slave into Egypt, and then through his suffering becomes second in command. I'm sort of blowing through the, the details of the story uh, that, that you would love to hear uh, if we were teaching on that. Um, but this, this, this was something to, again, represent the people of Israel becoming fruitful people through suffering. Joseph's story is, a, is almost a, a, a mini movie that says here's what to expect in the story of Israel. And then he spares people globally once he's second in command from massive hunger, a famine that went all over the world. And um, that also represents how Israel is to be a type of blessing to the rest of the world. Okay, so when the people of Israel recite these stories, they get reminded of their purpose that God has given them. And then uh, his family finds him because while he's in Egypt, they think he's long dead, okay? They come to Egypt years later to buy food because of the worldwide potential hunger. And they don't know Joseph's there, and he's the second most powerful man in the world because Joseph, because Egypt was the most powerful nation at the time. Um, But the way the story plays out, he forgives them. It's really, really beautiful. They relocate there to Egypt. And uh, they massively populate and become very successful. What does that remind you of? Go 
Really? That's the answer for everything, right? They become very successful people. What do we start the story with? Hmm? Yeah, be fruitful. Right. God's idea. Now demonstrated in his people of the Old Testament. Okay? They become very successful. They multiply in number like crazy. Everything they do is just, is just prosperous. Right? It's productive. And the king of Egypt sees that. And eventually, it, it says over time, the Egyptians forgot about Joseph. Generations and generations later, all they see now is this other people who's living in their territory, becoming very successful, very productive, and human nature going like it does. That king begins to feel threatened and says, I don't like this. What if they decide to create a rebellion and take us over? So he enslaves them says even though the more he put harsh labor on them, the more they increased in number. Fruitfulness in and through suffering, okay, representing the people of God. And so eventually there's, an, there's a law that goes out that any other sons that are born among the Jews have to be killed. That was the law issued out from the king of Egypt. The females were allowed to live. Why do you think? Right, because the Egyptian males could produce with them, and to them it was like it's creating more Egyptians. But the males had to die. Um, so we go from Joseph and the settlement in Egypt and their enslavement to Moses, the deliverance from slavery and the law. Okay, do we have a reader? Madam? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Okay, so you heard me talk about that. Language of God's intention for humanity. Uh, could you read that too, this one here? Or whoever's next? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, from the top. During the long period the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God, hearing their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Okay, so main thing I want to point out here is that God remembered his covenant. This becomes a phrase that's repeated in the Old Testament that is super important for the biblical story. And this will continue to come up that God remembers his covenant. Not that he has the potential to forget like it's wiped from his memory. But he remembers in that he is recalling what he set out to do and it will happen. And up to a certain point in the story, in the Old Testament story, the covenant is identified with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. In a little bit, which we'll reach tonight, hopefully, because we started a little bit late. Um, but I guess that just means I can go later, right? Just kidding. Um, another person will be included in this list. But right now, when we see God remembering his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come back to this, this story of Abraham... That, that, that we just went through, where God establishes that, that there will be a people that belongs to God. Yes. Yes, questions at the end. Thank you. Okay. So uh, in this story, what continues to happen is the king of Egypt, threatened by Israel's growth and success, he enslaves them, right? We went through this. <clears throat> now, when it comes to Moses... Moshe, pronounced in Hebrew, which means to draw out, because Moses is taken out of the running water, which we'll see in a bit. Um, hoping to avoid his death, Moses' mother sends him down a river in a basket as a baby to the king's daughter. And this is a brave mom. She's taking a chance. She's hoping, probably, that 
the nurturing womanly instincts will kick in. And when she sees how beautiful this baby is, hopefully she'll see the baby as beautifully as his own mother sees him. And she'll have compassion. Okay, because Jews were circumcised as a sign of the covenant, which was established with Abraham. That's where circumcision originates from. I don't know if you knew that. Okay? Um, and, and that's what's been happening with Jews ever since. So uh, in a case like with Moses, probably she saw the circumcision and knew he was a Jewish baby. This was after the law went out. And she does take him in when she sees him. He winds up down at the place where she would bathe, and that's just how they did it back then. They didn't have hot water systems. The sun would heat pools of water, and that's where they would go out to take a warm bath. Knowing that the queen took a bath there, she sent the baby down there. Um, the, the, um, I said the queen, the princess, the king's daughter, sees the baby, uh, takes him in, and then Moses' sister, brilliant little girl, I don't know if the mother put her up to it, but she says, uh, excuse me, um, I know the mother of the baby for whatever it's worth. And if you would like, I can bring the baby to the mother to be breastfed until he's the age where he, do he doesn't need that anymore. And then I can bring him back to you because the princess took him in to raise him. And she said, yeah, you know, that's a good idea. Why don't you go ahead and do that? And so Moses is safely back with his mother at least until at the point where he no longer needs to be breastfed. All right. Um, do we have a reader? One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he said to the one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill, kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian. Okay, so Pharaoh is the Egyptian title for the king. And in the story, it just goes from Moses being taken in to this. Okay, there are no other details that are given to us. Kind of like when Jesus was born, uh, you have some details in that birth story. The only detail you have beyond that in one of the Gospels is that Jesus was 12 year, years old in the temple. His parents think he's lost it. Other than that, it's right to when he was released into ministry as an adult. Okay, Same thing here. And what's going on here is that somehow, it doesn't tell us how. I wish it did. But somehow Moses knew he was a Jew. Maybe by his circumcision. Maybe the king's daughter sat him down and told him he's adopted. I don't know. I don't know. But somehow he's aware. And knowing that, he's seeing his people in slavery. Okay, number one. But in specific, he's seeing a Hebrew slave being beaten. And who knows what's going through his mind. This could be me. Faced with a decision at that point. What do I do? Sorry for them. Ain't my fault I was brought in here and got this privilege. Glad I am. Or am I here for a purpose? Is there something that I should do for the rest of my people who are not in this position of privilege to be able to do? And he attempts to do something. He attempts to rescue this slave and kills the Egyptian soldier who's beating him, probably thinking he'll get praised for it. And maybe he, he, ha, he could have been thinking for a long time, there's a revolution he's going to start, a rebellion. And maybe this was the beginning of it. But it goes bad on him because the people of Israel don't appreciate it. 
Now, he has to hide this if he doesn't get supported. Because what could have always been in the back of the mind of the king of Egypt, knowing that his daughter took this baby in? What could he have always been thinking from the beginning? Do you think? Now, you got to speak up. I tell my students this all the time. I don't know why. When I start to invite feedback, they start to mumble. Okay? If you have an answer, say it loud. Say again. That he might eventually try to start this rebellion on behalf of his people. And now he makes this move. And if his people aren't, if nobody's behind him from the people who he's trying to save, then the king's going to have him killed. Maybe thinking, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. I told my daughter not to bring him in. Right? So he has to run away. And he's gone. He's about my age, two years younger. I'm 42 now. I got to start. Where are my glasses? Right? I see these little floaty things that nobody else sees, but for some reason I see my little floaty friends all the time now that I'm 42. But not an old person. He was young. He was healthy. He was strong. And it doesn't go the way he wanted. So he runs away out of Egypt. And is able to hide, winds up getting married. 40 years go by. 40 years. At age 80, God appears to him to send him back to Egypt to speak to the king. 80 years old. He's got a speech problem. Maybe his teeth are gone too. And literally says, I'm not the guy. God, I'm not the guy. What story does it remind you of that we just got finished going through? Abraham, right? Incapable within himself, but this is what God wants to use to show that God will make happen what needs to happen in order to remain faithful to his covenant. Okay? Here's what God says to to Moses. Is there a reader? Okay? Yes. Yucky. Exodus 16. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There it is. Covenant. Go ahead. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at the Lord. And the Lord said, I have seen the indignation of my people on the earth. I have heard them crying out because of their perverse desires, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from their present condition and bring them up out of that land which is filled with slaves and robbers, a land flowing with milk and honey. He said, now go. I am sending you to show the people of this land that the Israelites are not their people. Thank you. How do you have a mic and still quiet? Maybe you got to get a little braver with your voice. Thank you. Um, so... Recalling of the covenant, down at verse 8, or 9 rather, um, he want, God wants to bring them out of slavery. Slavery, think of the kind of restrictive work that slavery is compared to what God had in mind when he made humanity. And says, I want to bring them into a good, spacious land, big open, room to grow, room to be productive, kind of land, kind of living, kind of work, a land flowing with milk and honey, resourcefulness, abundant, overflowing with resources, and now I'm sending you to the king to bring my people out. Okay, so God recalls his covenant in a context of justice and freedom from oppression. I can't say much about this now because of time, but justice, talk of justice in society is very important for Christians to be in the conversation on. And maybe one day uh, we can have a discussion, you know, about uh, Christianity and justice. If I'm brought back to do so, we can, you know, hint, hint, okay? But we can't do that now. But here God is recalling his covenant in such a situation. 
And in fact, if, you know, in case you might not know, Martin Luther King Jr., who personally I think is one of the, uh, who is one of the best representations of leadership that has to do with the gospel and justice in history, in world history. Uh, but um, had a brain freeze. Um, Martin Luther King, right? Um, justice coming from oppression. Um, okay, well, it'll come back to me. So God's plan to have a people who will live in a lander environment that's spacious, resourceful, so that they can expand, develop, and be productive. Okay, so the idea is take them out of really what's an opposite situation of God's intention into his original intention. Fruitfulness, multiply, uh, spacious, productive. All right. We have a reader. Moses said to God, suppose I go through the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Okay, recalling of the covenant. And now something I think you just be interested to learn a little bit on is this, this whole, this way that God identifies himself. Moses wants to know, who do I say sent me? There, there's a lot just culturally that's going on here, okay? Israel worshipped one God. Other nations, including Egypt, around the world, worshipped many gods, okay? In a sense, Moses might be saying, which God do I say is telling you or, or is telling the king to set them free? And then that, that starts playing out. When Moses goes to tell him. But God does give him something. Recalling the covenant. I'm the God of your people. The one that hasn't forgotten about you. The one that's still going to do what he set out to do. And you can say I am. Is the God. Who says this. Okay. So. This is. That's, uh, that's Hebrew. That is the term. For the phrase. To be. Pronounced Hayah. Okay. <clears throat> this, as you can see, looks similar. There's this. Okay. You see that red dot? This little letter here, what's called the Yod, it's the Y equivalent usually for us in English. And then this here is often interchangeable with that little Yod. And this, Y-H-V-H, -H, okay, is a form of this one up here. A third person form. First person is when you refer to I or me, right? I am holding the pointer. That's speaking in the first person. If I hand it to this young lady here and say, you are holding the pointer, that's second person. If I hand it to my friend here and I'm talking to her, I say, he is holding the pointer. That's third person. This is third person here of to be which basically is translated, usually thought to be translated, he who is. And if we get the vowels right, that's kind of a little more complicated because these here are just consonants. Vowel points didn't come in until later in the Hebrew alphabet. So with some terms, there's some speculation. But uh, generally, the idea is uh, this is the name pronounced Yahweh or Yahweh, which would be translated he who is. Tell them Yahweh sent you. Sometimes pronounced Yahuwah. Again, this is all because of, of the possibilities of what the vowels are. But generally translates he who is or makes to be or makes to become the source of existence. Got that? Now this is the name for God. 
God is not his name. God is a title, right? You have Tommy, which is his name, and then Pastor, which is his title. God is the title. Yahweh is his name. And anytime you see in your Old Testament, which you mostly will see, whenever you see the Lord, and Lord is all capital letters, it's referring to this here. In the Hebrew, it's this here. Generally thought because Jews wanted to be careful to not pronounce the name wrong. Because in their minds, that would be taking God's name in vain. So in the English, just to settle it, they translated it over as Lord, but all capitals, so that when we see all the capitals, we know that that's referring to the name. And sometimes they just say the name, right? Um, and then L-O-R-D, smaller, uh, small cap, small letters. No such thing as small capitals, right? I should, okay. Um, that's the word for like ruler, or if you ever heard the term Adonai, that's the Hebrew word for ruler, boss, lord, okay? All right. Um, okay. So, um, look at this here. Now, I just want to say this much more at this point about Moses is that God tells Moses to say to the king, this is what the Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitals, Yahweh, he who is, this is what the God Yahweh says. Israel is my firstborn son. Tiny little phrase, super important for the entire biblical story. Super important, okay? There are a lot of sermons written in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, right, Ezekiel, that refers to a son usually referring to the people of Israel. The people of Israel are referred to as God's son. The Jews understand that. They would say, we as a people are the son of God. Okay, but more on that to come later. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel says, let my people go that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And that's what I was going to say about Martin Luther King, is that he quoted from Exodus, told you it would come back. It may take a while. I'm 42. It takes a little longer now. Uh, he quoted from Exodus in his, in his stance, right, against America or, or the treatment of America to African Americans, let my people go, quote from Moses. Okay? He was combining his theology and applying it into justice. All right, um, that they may hold a festival to me. Pharaoh said, who is, L-O-R-D, all capitals, who is Yahweh? It's not being, maybe not being sarcastic, but literally asking, which God is that? That I should obey him and let Israel go. I don't know Yahweh, and I will not let Israel go. And the king of Egypt, which was in like most places in the world, the king was usually seen as like a god or a son of a god. So for him, it was almost like a personal challenge. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, did not take Moses seriously because Yahweh was not one of the gods of Egypt. Okay? Now, the people of Egypt, as well as other groups around the world at the time, worshipped many gods, which is called polytheism. What does that prefix in the beginning, poly, mean? Many, many gods. Theism, coming from a Greek word, theos, we inherit a lot of our language from, uh, from ancient Greece. You can be proud, Pastor Tom. So polytheism means many gods. Monotheism would be one god. That was a radical new idea that came from the Jews. Judaism is the mother of monotheists both Christianity and Islam, that there's only one God. When we talk God, we think the rest of the world thinks that way. Is there a God or is there not? That was literally a radical new idea. Nobody else was believing that way until God is introduced through Judaism. And those Jews, those people, yeah, they worship just one God. That, and that's actually really, really important for God or, or from God's point of view for his people to know. 
and remember, which we'll look at in a second, maybe in the next couple of slides. Okay, let me just read through this real quick here. The Lord says to Moses, you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand. He'll let the people go. Because of my mighty hand, okay, I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from the yoke of the Egyptians. I will take you as my own people. God having a people, very, very important. I will be your God. I am Yahweh, your God. I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, covenant. I am Yahweh. What's being communicated here? Yeah, one God and what's God saying about himself? He will do this. He, it will be me. God who alone walks between the pieces, the cut pieces for the covenant will make this happen. Through an 80-year-old who's given up on broken dreams. Okay? So God reminds Moses that it's God's own power that will rescue them and not Moses' ability. God's intention for a special representation of himself is demonstrated here in this story as is with Adam and Eve. God's name is identified with what he will do for his people. This is not some human being who will do this. I, Yahweh, have spoken. And that's said a lot uh, in the Old Testament story. God's people will be identified with their God and no longer by their condition in Egypt. No longer by the condition of slavery, but by their God and his intentions for his people. And promises on the basis of God's self putting his name on the line and identifying himself with his covenant, okay? What happens throughout the rest of the story of Moses, you got the ten plagues or the ten disasters that are given to Egypt for not listening. There's the death of the firstborn in Egypt, which is like the peak of those disasters that are given to Egypt. The splitting of the Red Sea, God splits the Red Sea through Moses. They all make their way out. The Egyptian soldiers who want to capture them try to follow. The sea crushes back in on them, kills them, wipes them out. Israel's out of the land now, and they're free. But the unfaithfulness of the people of Israel results in a 40-year delay of entering the promised land. So 40 years goes by because God says, my people have been so unfaithful, which becomes another repeated theme is God's faithfulness, but the unfaithfulness of his people. He says, I'm going to wipe out the whole older generation. I'm tired of it. I, 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 they're complaining. They're, they actually turn to worship other gods after, or create other gods for themselves out of gold after God delivers them. He says, I'm, uh, the, the, the older generation, I'm going to let them live, but they're going to die out here in the desert. And the younger generation will get to go in and see the promised land. So for that reason, it's a 40-year journey for them to get to the land of Israel, what becomes the land of Israel. In that time, in those 40 years within it, Moses is given the Ten Commandments, which is the foundation for Israel's law that's issued to them. Okay? Um, okay, reminder of the covenant. So this is kind of what it would look like when it comes to the law. The Ten Commandments are like the major big building blocks underneath it all, okay? On top of the commandments are 613 Old Testament laws, but all ways of trying to flesh out the Ten Commandments based on the Ten Commandments, okay? Now, this is not religious law which was something different from societal law. This law that God gives to Moses to give to the people is their societal law. Their lawyers were experts in the Jewish law given by God. The judges made judgments based on this law given by God in their courtrooms. You understand that? Okay. Uh, and so here's this whole monotheistic thing. And this is... This is, I can't express how important this statement is to the Jewish faith, okay? And, and to understand the, the whole story and the beauty of it is to know the importance of the Old Testament tying into the New Testament. And at the heart of even the Ten Commandments would be what's called the Shema. 
Anybody ever hear of that before? The Shema, a couple of people, right? Of course, one who got his master's degree. Okay. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, L-O-R-D, all capitals, Yahweh, your God, is one. The word Shema means to hear or to listen. Okay? That's it in Hebrew. To hear or to listen with intent to obey. Not just hear this sound. Right? But like when you say to your child, as I <clears throat> do to my, to my boys often, listen to me. Listen when I talk to you. Right? Okay? Obey. Obey. Give yourself to the one God. And know that you are distinguished as my people in the world. Because for you there is but one God and one alone. Regardless of what all the other nations around the world are doing. That becomes another point of failure. Is looking at everybody else in the world and saying, we want to be like that. But we'll see that in a bit. Okay? And this is Israel's most central core value. They pray it. All the time, there are songs written with the words of the Shema, okay? Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Now, here's the rest of a little section here when God declares this to his people. Here is your, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. These commands I give you today are to be on your hearts Impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, <clears throat> when you lie down and when you get up. This is to be your way of life. Okay? Do we have a reader? When the yes. Lord, oh. Go ahead. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you. Thank you. Nice to hear a little bit of a southern accent. Mix it up a bit. So what do you have? What do you have first that's underlined there? I mean, you see what the words are, but what's it imply? Covenant, yes. Recalling of the covenant. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A land filled with all kinds of good things. What's it remind you of? What? Okay, talk to me more. Garden of Eden, what about the garden? Be fruitful and multiply. Right? Be fruitful and multiply. Um, do not forget Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That whole event of the deliverance of Israel from slavery out of Egypt becomes core for the people of Israel to continue to be reminded of so that they would remember God. Serve him only. Reminds you of what? Monotheism, Shema. The Lord your God is but one. There is only one. For the Lord, your God, who is among you, is a jealous God. Ooh, that sounds bad. God's a loving God. God is a jealous God. Like I'm a jealous husband. Somebody tries talking to my wife, guess what? Okay? If I didn't care and said, well, whatever's on your heart to do, come on, man. Get out of here with that. God is jealous for his people, not of, 
for, jealous for his people. Okay, so now we move from Moses. We had him being used to deliver the people out of slavery and issuing the law to the people. So, so there's this shaping taking place. Once they're delivered, there's this shape of them as a people and how they will live and what it means for them to be distinct as Jews and to live within this covenant of their one and only God. Okay? That's what's occurring in this flow here. We now go to what's called the monarchy. What do I mean by monarchy? More mumbles. Yes, sir. Yeah. King, right, right. A kingship, which is a pretty crazy story. Pretty crazy story. From that um, development of, a, of an Israeli king actually comes the nation splitting. I don't know if you can see that too much from the back. Right? Okay, but that's monarchy slash nation split. Okay. So now we come to the kings of Israel. And this is going to bring us to uh, basically the remainder of the Old Testament story. Because a lot of stuff comes out of this. Okay. The books that give the historical record of the kings are 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Samuel and Kings are a flow, okay, that have like a historical progression. Chronicles is like a, a, a retelling of those same stories from, first and, from Samuel and from Kings, adding other stories maybe that those don't have. So just like a different record of the same stuff. But in 1 Samuel, which is mainly what we're going to deal with, is that and um, 2 Kings. The main figures, you have Samuel the prophet. I wanted to name my youngest son Samuel. The word means um, the peace of God. Shema and El, short for Elohim, which is the word for God. Shimuel, that's how it's pronounced, and my wife, oh, my wife, um, she has a close friend whose son is named Samuel, so I don't know if this is like an ego thing between ladies, I never noticed it before, this situation, but she didn't want to name our son the same name so as to look like we were doing what her friend was doing and trying to, like, name him the same thing as she was named her son. Right? Like she wanted to be able to say, no, I named my son. So instead we named him Joshua, which I call him Yoshi. So he's my Yoshi boy. But he should have been Samuel. I don't tell him that. You got Samuel, a prophet. You got Saul, Israel's first king. And David, Israel's second and greatest king. Anybody know what the star is called on the Israeli flag today? Star of David. Right. Okay, reader. First Samuel. When Samuel the prophet grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba, but his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Thank you. I caught there how you said Ramah. Very good. Most people say Ramah. Right? Okay. Um, here's the situation. Samuel's got some sons. He may have a heart too good for his own good so that he won't confront his sons. I, I, I never understood that. I got to tell you. I just wasn't raised that way. You know, my pop, I was scared of my pop. And I th I'm thankful to him for that. Right? Anyway, okay. Um, so he had these sons, right, and he wouldn't confront them. And the people noticed 
and said, uh, your sons aren't worshiping God. This isn't working out well. Uh, we don't like how this can turn out. Now, it could have been an excuse to try to get something going that they had always wanted going, but just needed the right opportunity, which was this here. Give us a king. Where is it at here? To lead us how? Like all the other nations, we want to be like the rest of the world. When God gives them the Shema to remember and to listen and to obey, that they are to be distinct in the world by having only one God. And that meant, unlike the other nations of the world that have a king, you will have no human king. I'll appoint you judges, but no king. Who's to be the king? God would be the king of his people. In the other nations, the human being was seen as a god. You have but one god, and he's your king. They wanted to, now you have this description of the pattern of unfaithfulness. You want us to be separate and special in the world? We want to be like everybody else. We're looking on and we like what they got going on. Okay? Another reader. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, <clears throat> this is please Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his right. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So here's this picture of unfaithfulness. As Israel wants a king for themselves, and God tells, so Samuel, there's something about him that's still salvageable. Okay, whatever's going on between him and his sons, something about him still wants what God wants, and he gets distressed by the fact that the people are saying, we want a king. And he takes it to God, says, God, what do I do with this? God says, God calms Samuel down. It's okay, give them what they're asking for. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Sounds a little bit like the garden. Give them what they're asking for. In brief, Romans speaks a little bit about this when it comes to human nature. That some people are given over to the things that they're determined to have and to want and to experience. Things that are not what God intends, but they are so intent on wanting that and living, them, living that way, let them be given over and indulged in it and then have to suffer um, what comes as a result of that indulgence if that's what they really want. Now he tells them down here, but warn them, let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. They want a king, give them their king and let them know what that king is going to want. Let him know the taxes he's going to want. Let him know the, the, the rights that he's going to take. If he wants to come in and rip away their resources because he wants them, give them their king. And let them know what it's going to be like when they have them. Okay? So that they see the whole picture and not just the part that excites them. Next reader. But, but the, the people were few. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll do up here and then. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all of the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. Okay, so the story's continuing to unfold. Um, all right. Um, let me just skip through this for now and say Saul's story has to be one of the craziest stories in the Bible to me. 
Uh, I mean, it, it, really, it, it really trips me out. I don't, there's stuff about it I just don't understand. Because Saul starts out with a lot of humility to really cut out a lot and, and, and get to the chase. Samuel the prophet goes to him. They interact. He anoints him as the new king, which I'm going to just get into that in a second. Um, but Saul's response is like, me, from the tribe I come from, I'm like the least of somebody who should be a king. I mean, he had a good physical appearance. He was, said he was real handsome, uh, a head taller than everybody else. So ladies, he was the pick, right? But the way he saw himself, is there some kind of popping going? Is that me? Not popping as in, you know, like, I don't know if I should. What? Oh, fireworks. Oh, okay. Yeah, you started pointing over there. I was like, hold on. Um, get some things really popping in here. Uh, where was I? Uh, Saul, humility, right? Um, and, and now he starts out like almost like the ideal, spiritually speaking, humble, and then turns out really, really bad. Becoming king, just the power, right, the position, it does funny things, right? But he's anointed, has not the Lord anointed you, ruler over his inheritance, in Israel, a prophet pouring oil over someone's head was a way of declaring that person to be the new king, okay? Now, the word for that, the verb, to anoint, is mashach, the sort of noun version of that, okay? Add a couple of letters, uh, and, you know, in English, we put another word on there in in the ancient language, they just sort of change up the word to give it a different form uh, to mean something else. So, Mashiach is the word for one who is anointed, and this was done either for a king or a priest, but in the biblical story, we see mostly for a king. Does that word Mashiach sound like anything to you? Yes. Messiah. Okay. That is the word for Messiah. Now, I know we have our ways of using the word anointing today, but if we take it back to what it was intended for, was this right here. So, in a sense, Saul was a Mashiach, one who was anointed, one who was a king. The Lord will not reject his own people because he was pleased to make you his own. I uh, just point that out to, to remind you that God will do what he intends to do for his people and will not forget that he intends to have a people that will represent him in the world. Okay, so God will be faithful to his covenant and to his people. I want to jump to... Well, this is crazy. I'll just mention this. After it goes bad with Saul, look at what God says. I've regretted that I've made Saul king. Sounds a lot like what happens in Genesis 6 with Noah, that I've regretted making humankind that I've made in the earth. Okay? Same impression is supposed to be given to the reader. Uh, and here's... Samuel confronting him, you were once small in your own eyes, you were once humble, almost like, but now look at you. Now we come into David, God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse, that's David's father, with an invitation to make sacrifices, through which God would show Samuel, who will replace Saul. Each of Jesse's sons come into Samuel's presence, beginning with the oldest, soldiers, soldiers they are, starting with the oldest, who would expect I get first dibs, right? That's how it was for inheritance. First sons were it. God tells Samuel, that's not the one. All seven of them, nope, not the one, not the one. Goes through all of them. The father doesn't even bring in David. David's the youngest boy, like my Yoshi, the youngest boy, a shepherd out in the field watching the sheep, watching these gentle little animals. Well, I got one more. And we'll bring him in. Soon as Samuel sees him, he knows. God tells him, don't look at the outward appearance. Man looks at that. People look at that. And then based on that say, 
ah, that's the one. I look at the heart. And Samuel knows right away when he sees David, this is the one. Pours oil over him. He's meant to be the next king. A lot of them cutting out, but a lot of crazy stuff happens to David to the point where Saul, he's like lost his mind. Because here's what it says happened to Saul. Um, David also, a Mashiach, okay, because he's anointed. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul basically lost his mind. And his jealousy was unstoppable. So for years, once he could see that attention was going to David, he began to hunt him down and do what he could to take his life. And David's running, estimated about 10 to 13 years after he's anointed to be king. Um, running and hiding for his life so that Saul won't kill him. But this is mainly what I want to point out with David. Your house and your kingdom, God says to him, will endure forever. Before me, your throne will be established forever. That's what's called the Davidic covenant. There's the Noahic covenant, what was said to Noah. The Abrahamic covenant, what was said to Abraham. And now the Davidic covenant. This begins to be added in. Now, from this point in the story, when God recalls his covenant to his people, that which I said to David, right, when I promised David, for the sake of David, I will such and such, okay? Very important for the biblical story, and when we see some things described about Jesus. Um, Solomon builds the temple, who is David's son. I'm just going to have to skip through that and tell you that, but the temple becomes super important because you remember Genesis 1? Earth being like a temple in its description. God dwells in the temple through his image. The temple placed in Jerusalem, which was like the New York of Israel, it becomes the place where the people literally go to meet God. It's, it was looked at as that's where he lives. And once it's built and the, it's called the ark, it's like a box with the tablets of the Ten Commandments in them, they brought that as the final thing in the temple. When they set it in, it says there was a cloud that got so thick in there that the priests couldn't perform their ceremonies that they intended to do in celebration of the temple because God's presence was so thick in the temple. That was built by Solomon. Okay, But the people, or, or Solomon rather, um, he was a woman lover, not in a good way. Uh, had many, many wives, 700 of them. Ay Dios. Um, and uh, 300 concubines, which are like women just for sexual pleasure. Okay? Um, and those women turned his heart away from the one and only God. And so he partnered with other nations. He got wives from other nations, which when God says don't intermarry, it's not because God is against interracial or inter-ethnic marriages. It's because the idea was when you do that, you're also accepting the worship of their gods. You got to set that boundary, okay? Um, but Solomon proves unfaithful, as do many of the kings after him. At that point, the kingdom splits between a northern and southern kingdom. Northern kingdom is Israel, which are 11 tribes, and then Judah is by itself a tribe, the southern kingdom. So it's like a civil split, right? Like in America, we had the war between the north and the south. That's what happens here. Uh, but this is a long-term split, designated for covenant to David's heritage. He says, because I will remember what I promised David, I will not uh, let the tribe of Judah go. Okay. All right. Now, from there to finish out, hopefully in about three minutes, we come to what's called um, exile or captivity, which is basically the way the Old Testament story ends. And you're kind of left with this. If it were a movie, you would it would end with a sense of dissatisfaction. Okay. Because, well, do you know what it means? Exile. 
yeah, cast out. The word ex in there always is something for to go out, right? Exit, ancient Greek, influence. Uh, exile is to be brought out, brought out of their nation as slaves, captives into other nations, right, that took them out. That is because to boil it all down as simply as possible, throughout the rest of the Old Testament story and the story of the monarchy, Israel's unfaithfulness gets warned and warned and warned by guess who? Not a person, but a role. The prophets. Okay? What is a prophet? Anybody know? Tells the future, so that's, that's something they would do. But there's a bigger, what'd you say? Someone who speaks on God's behalf, okay? A spokesperson for God is what a prophet was. And there were uh, men and women prophets, okay? Um, the woman was, was usually referred to as the prophetess, both Old and New Testament. The predictions, okay? Messages of warnings for disobedience and unfaithfulness. The prophets are giving messages over and over. Stop intermarrying. Stop worshiping these other gods. Stop these partnerships, these business partnerships with other nations that require that you accept their gods. God set you apart for his. You have what? Shema. Right? You have one God. You are his people. If you don't, you will be brought out of your land that I gave you into slavery, into opposite my intention for you. That's part of what's going on here. They plan to take you into slavery. Some of it is I'm going to use them to bring you into slavery. Worship me and me alone. It's continued unfaithfulness, continued unfaithfulness. Okay. Uh, these messages were delivered to the kings, to the priests, and to all the people. The major prophets are, now this is in quantity, not quality. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, big, you know, 50, 60 chapters in those books. The minor prophets, just as important, but a lot smaller in size, okay? A few chapters long in most of those cases. And so here's what it boils down to. I'll read this as our last slide. In 2 Chronicles 36, the word, well, actually, let's have a reader. Let's have a reader. Yes. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his word, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of the Bab Babylon Babylonians. They sent, I'm sorry, it's, I'm, hold on. You're good, you're good. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the temple and broke, um, they burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant mm -hmm. who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came mm -hmm. to power. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, remnant is a uh, right, small amount that's left. Uh, I do have one more slide after this. So that, that, that breaks down, that summarizes what goes on in the rest of the Old Testament story, the results of unfaithfulness, okay? Now, when it comes to, okay, so remember banishment, the garden. Israel views the ultimate consequence of sin as banishment from the story of Adam and Eve to the story of the history of their people, okay? Ultimate result of sin. Very important for the biblical story. And what's left, as far as the hope of the Jews, is that over time, they begin to interpret some of the writings as this figure who would come and change all of that. Who is that figure? Don't give the name, give the title. The title. Messiah, Mashiach. There was an ultimate Mashiach. An ultimate king, an ultimate anointed one from God who would, their, their, their main expectation is that he would deliver them from uh, the other nations of the world, okay, the other peoples of the world, and 
Give them primary position. Give Israel, God's people, primary position in the world. But there was some stuff in here about suffering as well that made them say, what's some of this about? Usually the more powerful stuff was what they paid attention to. And, and there's interpretations today among Jews that are like, well, Israel is the son. We've gone through a lot of suffering. It's speaking about our own suffering, but we will be delivered by a figure from our suffering. And he's trying to work out who this Mashiach is. But historically speaking, it goes from Assyria to Babylonia to Persia. These nations they're in, they're in captivity to, they're enslaved to. Eventually, Rome is the world power that has jurisdiction over Israel. So Rome gives Israel a little bit of playing room. They could still worship in their temple and stuff, but Rome is over them. And they look at it as oppression so that when the Old Testament ends, it's just like, boom, slavery, God deliver us. But God hasn't forgotten his covenant, but they haven't been delivered yet. End of story. End of Old Testament story. And they're looking, waiting. Send this figure to deliver us and give us your original intention. Okay? The ultimate Messiah. When Jesus shows up on the scene, which is where we'll pick up tomorrow and in our final night, Rome is in power and Israel is still waiting. Okay? Uh, sorry I had to skip through a few things. It's not my fault. Pastor Tommy started late. So I had to rush through a few things. Um, do we have time for about... I don't know, five minutes or so of... It's all my fault. Yeah. Yeah. We got time. Okay. We have 15 minutes exactly. Okay. So okay. mine. Um, oh, wow. Did it to me again. I didn't have to rush through some of this stuff. Okay. Uh, all right. Questions? Yes. Yep, thank you. The the slide that you have that has the um, winding roads with the mountain. Yes. Um, can we go back to that slide really fast? If oh, Lord. Possible? Let me see. <laughs> um. and maybe maybe far back while you're doing that, well, I'm going yeah, to ask my question. Go ahead. Um, and, and I guess I'm asking this in the context of us being, uh, yep, being a multi-ethnic uh, church, multi-ethnic people here. Um you, you did an incredible job at talking about the covenant and what that means and where that was established. You briefly mentioned about the, the covenant that he established with Noah. But can you, can you speak a little bit to, as you, as you alluded to Jews referencing, referencing Abram as their father, should they really go back to Shem and recognizing Shem as their father and what that means for us from a racial standpoint with Noah's three sons and the covenant that was established with them. And I guess, again, on the backdrop of me asking that question, I think historically people groups of color have been excluded from feeling like they were a part of the covenant. Right, right, right. When in fact they were not. Right. They were very much a part of the covenant. Right. So. Yes. Good. I, I asked like Good. two different questions in there, but. Good. Good. I was about to ask if you were a Hebrew Israelite, but your head shaved and you don't have a beard, so. No, I'm not Hebrew no, Israelite. No, but no, actually, this is important. This is important uh, because, listen, culture is asking certain questions. And if it seems like there are places outside of Christianity that are giving better answers to those questions, they go there. I don't know if you know much about Hebrew Israelites. I actually have a friend of mine um, who... Um, was was kind of on a on a on a big stage uh, in a certain sport, and um, is is beginning to be intrigued by that you know by by the Hebrew Israelite, uh, and and I can see why, because I think there are cultural reasons for uh, what Pastor Christopher was explaining. We have tended to paint visual images of. People in the Bible, characters in the Bible, Jesus, what the Father possibly looks like, as Caucasian, Euro Western, or, or European, Western kind of, right? Um, and people of color who 
think long enough about these things, not all want to know, but some want to know, why? why? Why is that? Like, why can't there be the same sense of identification among my own people within my own house with God or with the story of the Bible? Um, and there are some basic questions or basic answers to that question that um, I don't want to take for granted because I might not, I might not personally have that issue of, of whether or not me or my ethnic people can identify with God, but I want to be sensitive to those who would. So just, um, just by, um, you know, even Moses, right, being raised in Egypt, the people of, of Israel being in Egypt, Egypt is a part of Africa. In this record, the people of Israel were there enslaved. Now, it could have been the actual slavery or total, and slavery was a part of this, 400 years. Okay? You think they're looking like people from Sweden while in Africa for 400 years? No, right now, the, 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 the place to be, to be careful is, and this is where I think Hebrew Israelites go wrong, is to make that a matter of who God's people are while others are not. So here's what I mean. While one group of people might be saying, hey, we don't seem to be identified in this story, right? That people must be included to show how they are a part of that story. But then that same group shouldn't say, ah, we realize we're a part of that story and these people aren't. No, no, no. No, don't take it in that direction. Because the biblical story, which I'm, I'm trying to say this without giving too much away, we're really going to see tomorrow night how part of the message of the gospel is that there is a celebration of all people. That is a major part of the message of the gospel. I don't want to say too much about that, but there are historical things to trace that show that people of color are very important and present in the biblical story. Okay, Jesus was not a white man. If you'd ask me, I'd say he'd look, he, he may have looked a lot like Osama bin Laden. Okay, the reason Jews look as European as they do now is for historical reasons for where they've settled in Europe. Okay, but the Middle East is the Middle East. And when Israel was where it was, before all of this going into exile, and, and or not even that, but later on, before settling in places of Europe, I mean... They look like the rest of the Middle East. And a lot of that traces back to Egypt and in Africa and, and areas surrounding that. So does that help answer the question? Okay, without giving away too much for tomorrow. But don't feel bad for asking that question because there are answers that sadly the church has not given enough answers to. And part of the reason, part of what makes it sad is that the church is not informed enough. I'm in debt tens of thousands of dollars to find out this stuff because of my education. The, the other reason I asked the question is because of, you know, and I'll, I'm going to throw Pastor Tommy out there for a moment, because his passion for the multi-ethnic church. Yes, yes. Um, it will be very important for us as members of this local church who have a pastor that has a heart like that mm -hmm. to understand the myths and the wrong theology that has gripped our culture and our country historically Mm -hmm. with regards to scripture and race. Yeah. Um, there's so much unhealthy and unbiblical historical teaching that suggests that people of color or people of color groups have not been a part of the covenant, are not a part of the biblical narrative, and, and just so many other things. So that's the reason why I simply bring the point up. Yeah, and, and you know what? I'll just add one quick thing to that, which is, um, so... At times it could be bad teachings. I think a lot of the times it's ignorance. And now ignorance is not like malicious. Ignorance is just not knowing. So a part of Christianity in America sometimes just doesn't know. They're excluding certain kinds of people when they do things certain way or say certain things. You can't please everybody, but you got to know who the people of your community are and you got to care about them. 
It's as simple as that. You got to care about their questions. You got to ask, I think, you got to ask the questions as to why are there conditions in my community among certain people and it's my Christian job to answer some of those questions and help try to get it resolved. Be glad you're at a place where these kinds of questions and discussions are welcome with the aim to address them and give people the right understanding of God to help answer their questions. Shem is one of the sons of Adam, or I'm sorry, uh, of Noah, who is, is said to be um, the figure who wound up, right, fill in any details for me, wound up in Africa, um, or it was Ham, though, yeah, actually. Yeah, so, so you, Noah's three sons, you take Noah's three sons, the, Ham, Shem, and the basis of all three major people groups came from Noah's three sons. So African Americans came from Ham, um, uh, Middle Eastern uh, came from, uh, I just had a mind freeze too, you passed it Jephthah. on. Japheth, thank you. And then um, Europeans came from Shem. So when you look at those three, as he alluded to earlier, the covenant that God established with Noah and his sons is a covenant of promise that, in fact, people of color or what, what America would call them minorities are not less than, are not not excluded from the promise, are not not as smart as, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, these are all um, myths that are still promoted in many pockets of our country. And, and many of us here maybe wouldn't know that because some of you in here may not have uh, a church background that, you know, was around that kind of stuff. But there was actually churches, uh, specifically more so in the South, if you study history, that really would use that biblical platform to say racism and discrimination is okay because these people are, you know, not under the blessing that Shem was. So because of that, you know, people that aren't of color are more superior. That was actually stuff that was biblically and theologically taught that gave them ex an excuse of why we can have slavery or why we can have certain laws that keep certain people groups down. And that was stuff that, you know, I didn't even know because obviously most of us didn't even come up during those times of the 60s or 50s when there was a lot of separate stuff. But if you look in history, and it's not always taught, in a lot of seminaries and Bible colleges, but you have to, you know, dig for some of that stuff. But that's what a lot of churches, how they kind of, because you'd look back and you say, man, how would Christians put up with slavery or put up with, you know, discrimination or even like separate water fountains or all that? Couldn't they see it? Well, some of them were taught that kind of theology and then would just be like, oh, okay, all right. And that was just kind of passed on from generation to generation that that stuff was okay. So, for me, I have this passion for the multi-ethnic church because Tone and I, we grew up with all kinds of friends, you know, and we all had, we, a, a lot of us, we, we all had different accents in our homes and people around us and people we hung out with. But even though ethnically we were different, a lot of the people we hung out with, you know, we had friends that were Chinese and Indian and Puerto Rican and African American and Jamaican and all that around us in Philly. There was a little mixture of a melting pot of everything. But hip-hop was like the thing that kind of brought us all together, hip-hop and basketball and, you know, kind of that whole urban style. Um, so we kind of grew up around this multi-ethnic thing and hip-hop being a very multi-ethnic thing. So when it came to, like, I I'm going to start a church in the urban community, of course everybody's included. It's organically, that's what it should be. It should be natural. So then me coming from that mindset and then seeing, like, man, why are churches so separate? Why is all this going on? But as you look at the history of some of the systems in our country and the discrimination and racism that happened through all these generations, we're still, like, trying to recover from that. So the church originally, if you look in the New Testament, it was multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-class. It was for the community. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Tone's going to get into that. But we've gotten away from that in America with all this separate stuff that's happened over hundreds of years. So And still happening, Pastor. Yes. 
And so I just, I, I, I'll say this one last thing about it. Um, I, I, you know, something like the Hebrew Israelites come to mind. If you've never heard of them, uh, then, you know, don't worry about it. But if you have, uh, there's a resurgence of them, of, of that group. It was, it was big in the 90s and in hip-hop. And it's sort of coming back that focuses on um, Africans being the Jews or the people of God. Some who believe in Jesus yet still say it's because of our, our bloodline that we are the people of God, which is very anti-gospel to say that. But the point is they're, they're, they're answering questions that the church generally doesn't seem to be answering in a satisfying way. So I can see why it's appealing. Um, so again, that much more reason to say, be glad you're at a place that welcomes those discussions and sees the importance of it in, uh, in a place where God is discussed. Yes, question. God chose Noah and his girl to go to the ark. They deserved a better story, right? He was telling me that out of all the people in the world, it was just Noah that was righteous. Everybody else had to do the right thing, and but God was willing to do something for his people. Yeah, yeah, tough, tough thing to swallow, you know. So his his question was, was it really only Noah? Was there nobody else in the world who was who was righteous, who God wanted to spare? Tough thing to swallow. That's what the story tells us. Matter of fact. It says in there that uh, what God was looking at when he was looking at the world was that all the, in, all the thoughts and intentions of the people was only evil all the time. Like it just got so bad that there was something in Noah. that so, so it would say, God told Noah this, and Noah did as the Lord commanded. It was meant to give the reader like a sense of, ah. Oh, the way God felt about Noah. Here was this one. Now, when you look at that isolated situation, again, that's a tough thing to swallow. There's a bigger picture to that because that becomes a bit of a theme throughout the biblical story that while there's so much mess, there's something that God connects with and says, I'm going to use for my purposes. And then there's a lot of mess that develops. There's this road. Things get crazy. They get, just get ways that you don't want it to go. But God steps in. I remember my covenant. And then bing, through this, I'm going to re-demonstrate it. Things get messy again and messy again. Ah, but here's this somebody. And now we're at the point where as we're ending tonight and coming tomorrow, there's Jesus. Right? But, but yeah, and, that's, and it's okay. To ask those questions. Pray about those. God, are you really telling me? One person, I mean the whole earth, right? And you'd be surprised at the same time what God would begin to show you when you're honest with your questions. Feel free to ask them. Feel free to ask them. Yeah. No, I got you. And, and this is a pretty common question, which is basically, what about the Jews now? Right? How are we on time? We're done. Okay, so that's the last one. Uh, excuse me if I might have to, you know, hurry up and get to it. But um, one thing I don't want to do is just paint a bad picture of the Jews. Okay? In the story, we find their unfaithfulness. There was, there was, all over the world, there was evil and wickedness in the story, but God wanted a people. The focus was on that people. In that story, you just see a pattern of unfaithfulness, right? It's not in the gospel, it's not the job of the Jewish people to give us the laws of God, right? I can't say the Jews are disobedient people as if I'm not a disobedient person. 
right? I am, I am, uh, I have, I am in need for God to give me his grace as much, if not more, than anybody else in the world, right? Now, this is unfortunately one of those where I got to say, you got to show up tomorrow because that's going to come up where when it comes to the Jews, they're not cut out from anything that God wants for them, but the difference is that there, there are others included with what God intended for the Jews. And there's a way that God does that through Jesus Christ so that now Jews and non-Jews are on an even platform. And that's part of the message of the gospel. So you have to be here tomorrow night to hear the details of that. So if everybody can stand up with us. Give it up for Tone tonight. He's going to be... He's going to be up here. If you guys have any other questions, I know that we weren't able to maybe take everybody's questions, but it's like 9.02 right now, so we want to honor your time, and I know the kids, how many of y'all got kids? They're about to be getting out in just a minute, so Pastor Christopher, come over here really quick. We're going to pray and close out, but uh, I want you really quick to talk, to talk uh, about... Talk, talk about the, the re-up series we're starting next week. Just whet their appetite real quick. Absolutely. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Wednesday nights we have a Bible study here, 7 o'clock. It's called re-up. Uh, next Wednesday we start a brand new series on the book uh, Living Among Lions, which is a series about uh, the life of Daniel and how Daniel uh, was able to thrive in the midst of a wicked and perverse culture. So you want to come and be a part of it. I mean, y'all know there's some crazy stuff going on in our culture. We feel like there's lions around us sometimes. So next week's going to be really good, so be there for that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pray. Really quickly, I just want to throw out there another plug again. Um, Southeastern University, we are starting a campus here at Crossover this August. If you're interested in getting a degree in ministry, learning more about the Bible, or there's also a track for business and an associate of arts, business leadership, um, you can actually get a fully accredited degree here, get financial aid. There's a bunch of financial aid stuff you guys can get. Um, literally, if you're a Florida resident, uh, a lot of you could almost go to school for free, for real. So you can come this Sunday and find out more about that after all three of the services. We're going to be having a short information meeting in the gym uh, with Pastor Greg. He's going to be leading that. So if you want to pick up a brochure or talk to him, he'll be in the lobby. You can sign up for the meeting. So, uh, it's his little paper on the table there. So grab your neighbor's hand real quick. Let's pray. Let's pray out tonight. Come to crossover just this Thursday night. Not next Thursday night, but tomorrow. Be here. It's going to be awesome. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your story. Uh, your story, God, the biblical narrative. God, we thank you for uh, Tone, Bruno coming down from Philly and pouring into us tonight, God, and uh, revealing some things, explaining some things in some new ways and tying uh, the story tonight, as we heard uh, of the Old Testament, all leading up to the Messiah. And uh, God, as many of us as possible, God, I pray you'll bring us back here tomorrow night um, so we can hear the final part and, and really hear the whole story capped off. God, we thank you tonight for what you've done with our children in the gym and in other parts of the building. Um, God, we thank you for all the people that are serving them and pouring into them. Get us home safely tonight. Give us a good rest, a great Friday tomorrow, and uh, a great weekend. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said, amen. Love you guys. Say what's up to some people around you. If you got questions, come on down.